Thank you, Dana and Martin, very much. Uh, it was a great uh, introduction, very flattering. Uh, and today we're going to be talking about paying down technical debt at GitHub. Uh, so just to recap very briefly, my name is Keith Ballinger. I am the SVP of engineering at GitHub. I've been here for about a year. And uh, we'll just pop right into it. You know, technical debt, something that we've all heard about, something that plagues a lot of engineering teams. And so what is technical debt? Martin Fowler has a really great description of it. He calls it cruft in a system that makes things harder to understand, makes it harder to change the system. And this technical debt uh, always exists. It's in every project. You don't get rid of it like debt in you know, any kind of economic system. Uh, it's there to help you at times move faster, to gain leverage. But you do have to pay it back. And when you have too much, things slow down too much. And as things slow down in terms of your, your ability to make changes, that's when you start seeing issues. Either your velocity slows down or you start having too many bugs that you can't keep up with, or you even have like reliability and other issues like that. So at GitHub this summer, we basically decided to uh, have a project where we were going to pay down this technical debt with very specific outcomes in mind. We uh, stopped most, not all feature development, to really focus the engineering team on swarming on these issues. We went out to ICs to understand what are the problems that they are seeing. And of course, we looked at you know, what are the problems we're seeing kind of holistically across the entire system. And out of that, we came up with three major objectives or work streams for how we wanted uh, to organize this effort. One was around both the outer loop, how you deploy software, but also our observability, both observability during a deploy and then just generally speaking. Another big set of work streams was around the inner loop and testing. That is, when someone is coding, they're making a build locally, they're running tests, all of those kinds of things. And then the final loop was, uh, final work stream was specifically around reliability. What parts of the system do we need to make better and stronger so that you know uh, the site is always up, always serving our customers in all cases? And so we organized across those. We had objective leads who kind of looked at each one of these three. And then underneath them, we created virtual teams of work stream leads to tackle very specific problems. And so we're gonna kind of go through that funnel with you today. And I'm gonna hand it off to Liz Soling, who was one of those objective leads focused on this outer loop and observability. Take it away, Liz. Thank you, Keith. I am excited to share with y'all some of the things that stood out to me that were great about the work that we did for this outer loop and observability objective. This was a big deal, right? To have this time to work with dozens of teams and hundreds of engineers, all focused on making things here easier and faster and really even some more fun to get things into the hands of our customers quickly. So we deploy to github.com a few dozen times every day. And that takes a couple of hours from each of the involved engineers. And that is assuming that it all goes to plan. So again, remembering those overall goals to make shipping github.com fast, uh, fast, easy, and fun. So we've been tweaking this process over time to make it better. And given that we had this opportunity to do so much more together, we asked all of engineering for their ideas and proposals. And we took some time to evaluate each one of those for the value and impact it could have on our deployment process. And you know, we had to make some hard decisions. We had a lot of good proposals. And ultimately, we selected these as some of the work streams that uh, the projects that we were going to work on. First, we wanted to look at how we could speed up our artifact builds. And we need some more progressive rollout stages and automation around them. And we noticed that there were recurring themes of deployment problems that we could eliminate that could take care of that need for manual intervention. So we aimed to increase that deployment success rate. And we also wanted to add some resilience in our deployment process to github.com outages so that we could use github.com more in our deployment process so that we could restore service faster when there is in fact an event. All right, so once we settled on what we were going to do, we took a minute to settle together how we were going to do it. Here's some of the things that we did that I thought really contributed to this going well for us. So I wanna give a, a quick shout out to all of the Workstream leads that worked with us this summer on this project. And I definitely wanna acknowledge and the outer loop Workstream leads that I got to work with. When I first met with each one of them to ask them if they wanted to go on this adventure with me, 
uh, we covered a well-defined set of expectations for the role, right? We had an MD file right in our overall project repository that listed all the details of what we expected from them, that they'd be ultimately responsible for driving the project with me, coming up with the plan, engaging other teams, running point on all the communications. And one neat thing to note here is that we didn't always select project managers or engineering managers, right? We extended this opportunity to a lot of different individuals and it worked given what we outlined and how we kept up with each other and the, the support that we had from the other leaders and around the engineering organization. Right, so the first thing the leads had to officially do was take a couple weeks and come up with a project plan. So to set them up for success, we were really particular that they had to work with one or two other people that fit a few perspectives so that we could fight bias right from the start. Of course, we needed someone who had that context, right? Where are things at now? What's been tried before? What pitfalls do we need to look out for? The next key person in here was someone who maybe wasn't as familiar with the current systems, but they had other relative expertise, expertise, experience, ideas. And not the least important was that if this wasn't already covered with the other two, we had to have a representative from the team that would be picking up this work and continuing to maintain it. We didn't want any, oh, they'll, they'll figure it out later type of afterthoughts. Sure, all of this was a little bit of an additional investment in our time to get to kicking off the work, but we saw some great things emerge as a result. Like there was a lot more buy-in than we've seen with other disruptive work. So with that, we kicked off the work. We ran the project like we typically would. And again, here's a few key points in running the project that really helped it, uh, really helped it sing for us. We reminded each other often to keep that healthy dissatisfaction with the status quo. So instead of running each project separately, you know, the leads met together often, especially right up front, right? We And then at least once a week after that. And we'd talk about where we could combine efforts and where can we build off each other's outcomes. Some of the things that we saw come out of this were that the outer loop, um, the metrics that we were developing for the de for the dashboards, we were quickly able to derive progressive rollouts with them. We'd already plan to do that. We just plan to get to it later, but we were able to pull that in and get that going quickly. And we did more than what we'd originally scoped for separating the merge queue out of the deployment process. That ended up cutting a big chunk of work that we were planning to do for deployment success rates. So just to reiterate on that healthy part of the dissatisfaction with the status quo, right? There's a natural tendency to focus on friction in the current system. And it was great to see people really acknowledging the work done and the people who did it and the dreams that they had for the things that if they had had all the time and people available that they could have done. But we really drove home that help, don't judge thing consistently. And it was great to see that throughout. Because really, we wanted everyone to focus on their well-being, especially this year, but always, right? Even getting started with us, we acknowledged how disruptive it was compared to continuing work we usually focus on. And taking that on this year, it wasn't a decision that we made lightly. And we tried to do some things to make it a little more fun, right? Like we worked on getting some swag together and there may have been some fun internal visits that we produced, but really we did focus on working together well. So as we progressed through the summer, as usually, you know, we, uh, we learned some things, we had to adjust, we had to accommodate new information and situations that came up. We ended up dropping some work streams that we originally planned to do so that we could really focus in and do the ones that we focus on well. Um, again, we didn't wanna squeeze ourselves. We really wanted to focus that energy while we had everybody's attention and move the biggest things forward together. And we also identified that we were generating a lot of work for other teams to implement. That fan out work to you know, implement the improvements across the organization. At one point we had to pause a bit and prioritize these better. So it wasn't going to each individual team to sort out for themselves. And that did affect some of our timelines, but it was quite, it was good to catch that early and get that moving. Okay, so fast forward a couple of months and here's what we were able to accomplish. First, we added several reliability features and thankfully we were able to maintain, we were able to do this without adding friction, right? We were able to maintain that critical queue to deploy time that we watch because we shave time off elsewhere. Um, we've seen our deployment frequency bump up. We're often delivering over 100 pull requests a day to github.com now. The number of deployment rollbacks we have to do are fewer and fewer. It saves so many hours of deployment interruptions each week. This past month alone, it was down another 15%. 
Last, uh, let's see, the time to resolve incidents when they do happen is vastly improved. And I want to mention a thing that I was super excited to see happen here. We set up a mirror of our GitHub repository so that we can build and deploy GitHub still when GitHub isn't available. The thing they, that we do it when it is. And another one I'm super excited about is that we're enabling merge queues for more of our repositories. We've separated out how we bundle up our pull requests and that's separate out of the deployment process now for that repository. So yeah, so all of this, along with some simpler confidence dashboards, again, that progressive rollout automation, and really, I believe, just involving so many more people to work on this experience and the outer loop and the observability, it led to this great improvement in our development happiness measurement that we take each quarter. 160%, y'all, like, that's, that's big. And I don't want to neglect to call out another key observation related to this, and that is the increased unity across the engineering organizations, right? So many teams had opportunities to work together on things that we wouldn't ever get a chance to collaborate on normally. And the results of that have been so positive. So yeah, so these results, right? They're, they're fun, they're really good. But really, how do we keep this up? That's what's really important. So we have now what I like to call anti-slip measures in place. Um, formally here, we call it our fundamentals program. But for every improvement, that we make, we set new benchmarks, we raise that bar, we monitor them each week to understand, does something need to be nudged a bit, right? We have that additional visibility to make it a lot easier to have these conversations with product managers and engineering leaders. And it makes planning able to factor this in better and it, at least be more aware of what we're gonna set aside if we're choosing to do other things, right? And we continuing, and we continue partnering and working with other teams who would really like to contribute. And this is helping us work smarter and be more effective and really get that high performing thing without having to work longer hours. So with all that, I am excited to hand it over to one of my favorite colleagues, KK. She's gonna to talk to us about the experience on one work stream in particular, one that really helps speed things up for us for continuous integration. Go KK. Thank you, Liz. Um um, everybody, I'm KK and I'm a staff engineering manager, but specifically on this effort to pay down technical debt, I was one of the uh, work stream leads. You know, as Keith and Liz mentioned, um, you know, as we build software for a long time, <laughs> as just how we had done in GitHub, we accumulate a ton of technical debt. Um, so right before we started this initiative, we asked the entire engineering org um, to suggest, you know, what kind of engineering improvements we want to see, what technical debt we wanted to purge. Um, and I had the privilege to work on one of the most popular requests made, that is to make our CI jobs run faster. Um, so let's talk about what goes behind the scene as we build GitHub. So GitHub.com is supported by a large Ruby monolith that is deployed several times a day. As an engineering team, we are reviewing and shipping hundreds of pull requests a day and at the same time. So we also care about quality and maintainability. And that's why our project contains about 7,000 test suites and 5,000 test files. So before every deployment and after every commit on an active pull request, we run all of our continuous integration jobs um, to ensure quality. These jobs are four in type. So there's build jobs, um, linting jobs, unit test jobs, and integration jobs. In total, we have about 25 CI jobs. Together, they take about 45 minutes to run. Well, 45 minutes is a long time to wait. And I often could get a workout in before you know, things are being ready for merge. But I also want to note that the, in the best case scenario, assuming all CI jobs were successful around the first run, um, the lead time to change that Liz was talking about, that is the time it takes for a piece of code to go from a developer's commit to a feature on the website took about two hours. And that's the best case scenario. Uh, of course, we also had break class scenarios in place in order to ship hot fixes to get around this 45 minute CI run time. Uh, but the norm was 45 minute and it is evident that it slowed down our development process and added to developer friction. So going back to that 25 CI jobs, we looked deeper into it and found out that all but two integration jobs took less than 13 minutes. So obviously the two integration jobs were considered a bottleneck in our deployment process. 
And a little more into that two integration jobs, we were actually running tests on our GitHub enterprise server builds. So, you know, what is GitHub enterprise server? Maybe you used it as part of enterprise teams, but we ship GitHub enterprise server every quarter and we make a patch release every two weeks. But on the contrary, we ship .com several times a day. So we wanted to find a solution that can guarantee the quality of every product we ship while still keeping the CI runtime as low as possible. So we developed a solution, calling it Deferred Compliance. Deferred Compliance is basically a tool that was integrated along with our CI workflow. This allowed our developers to continue to ship updates to .com, which is github.com, without having to wait for the results of the long running CI jobs that tested GitHub Enterprise Server. We essentially deferred that for a later time. Let's walk through a scenario. A developer, let's say, creates a pull request, gets everything reviewed, and it's set to merge. At this point, we set aside two different types of jobs. One, the long running CI jobs that run in the background, and two, the short running quick CI jobs that are essential. So as soon as all the essential short running CI jobs are complete, the pull request is set to merge and deployed on to uh, .com. Now, at the same time as the long running CI jobs are waiting, um, we have two scenarios that can happen. Things go succeed. That means GitHub Enterprise Server's quality is ensured, and we call it compliance is achieved. If the long running CI job fails, compliance is broken, and um, a developer is informed of this, and we have a 72 hour clock that kicks off. This 72 hours allows the developer to be able to fix the issue that was there on the GitHub Enterprise Server build and revert the or revert the change that they made. Um, if the fix or the change didn't happen within the 72 hours, a big hammer is thrown and all deployments to github.com is halted until the quality of GitHub Enterprise Server is restored. So we chose 72 hours, keeping in mind our global team. We wanted everyone to be able to continuously ship to GitHub uninterrupted around the clock. What 72 hours ensures that a potential build that was broken in GitHub Enterprise Server shipped by a developer in San Francisco, let's say on a Friday evening, doesn't block a developer in Sydney from making a change to github.com first thing on their Monday morning. As we worked on this, we used our own platform to remind developers um, through issues and notifications several times during that 72 hour window. And as Liz talked about, one of the key factors while while developing this solution was to gather context, collect the ideas, and find something that was maintainable. So as we build deferred compliance workflow in our CI system, we leveraged our products, issues, actions, workflow integrations. We focused on the key metrics to identify uh, bottlenecks and found a maintainable and a reusable solution. We ultimately built an internal tool that supports our developers and at the same time acts as a guardrail for product policies. And as for numbers, we reduce our CI time to 13 minutes, making our CI workflow three times faster. And then as an added bonus, we reduced our compute costs down by a fourth. This was improvement done just in one of the work streams. In the larger, uh, in the larger initiative, there was a lot more improvement as Liz talked about. But we focus on the fundamentals of development, tracking down important metrics, deploy frequency, change fail to rate, time to restore a service, and of course, what I fix, lead time to change. Above and beyond numbers, GitHub Engineering work together to identify, prioritize, plan, swarm on the most impact impactful issues that matter to us. We brought together teams from different parts of the organization to work on the fundamentals. And what warms my heart the most is how we were able to focus on our engineering platform, cracking down technical debt, making engineering uh, improvements so that we could continue to build the best in class developer products for you. With that, thank you so much for listening to how we fixed and worked on technical debt at GitHub. Thank you.